truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. I want to welcome to the program. Uh, probably one of the most recognizable members of Congress. Very interesting guy, former Navy SEAL, Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. Appreciate it. Listen, man, uh, you decided to make some news last weekend, and uh, we can talk about that in a minute. But but I wanted to get into you because one of the things that I I respect the most about you um, is that you're your own man in Congress. You have basically always said what's on your mind, always been a a straight shooter, whether or not that's popular within the party or the broader electorate or not. You've kind of given us your your view on varnished. And what I'm wondering about is how much of that is is your upbringing. And I know you lost your mother very young. I know you traveled a lot with your dad, obviously his military service and all kinds of things. Talk to us a little bit about sort of you, you're growing up, how you got interested in politics. Sure. Yeah. And we can get into the, this little, the fanfare from these last couple of days, which is, uh, I would say a minor blip on the radar compared, <laughs> compared to how, you know, how, how much, how bad things can be. I think this one is a bit silly. Um, and you know, I, we, we have, uh, we have forms that people can fill out with their hurt feelings, uh, at our office and then we can go from there. When people get very sensitive, especially when they realize that they can't control me. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's really what this is about when, when we get into this. But, um, and so I guess I would answer your question, you know, why can't I be controlled? And I think I would like to think that I have some sense of integrity, um, since some, some sense of integrity about, about who you are. And what, what I often say to people, to voters, is there's, there's a lot of slogans that you often hear from candidates. Like, here's one. I'm not going to go up there and, and, just, and just go along to get along, right? <laughs> How many times have you heard that one? <laughs> that's and like yet, talking point A1A, right? But, and yet that's exactly what they do. And it's just, it's just not who you think it is, right? right? It, the establishment isn't who you think they are. And I like this. Is, it's fascinating to me to, to, to watch people's sort of minds change as you talk about this, because they they just view the establishment as leadership, you know, strong arming everybody. And I'm like, leadership. I, I've never seen them strong arm anybody. You know, not I mean, a lot of I, tools to do that anymore. There's just not, um, you know, the strong arming comes from this sort of this kind of anti-establishment mob, which really is, if you're going to, I mean, I hate using words like the establishment, but if we're going to try and define it, that seems to be what it is, right? You must say the things, you must repeat the slogans, you must you must recite from this hymnal the things you need to say or else, or else we come after you and we call you names and those names will sound like neocon and rhino and establishment. <laughs> Like the people who do that, those those sort of gatekeepers of of the hymnals that they that they that they feel you must recite, that's the real establishment, and it's nonsense. And you know, and they and they play out as Instagram influencers and pundits, and and you know, and it's and it's just ridiculous. Um, and it, and it just it just feels like this clown show sometimes. Uh, and that that's what I'm fighting back against, right? Like this. This this sort of forced conformity where you have to say things a certain way. You have to yell the slogan, say no more endless wars, say it. <laughs> like, or else you're a neocon. And you're like, really? Like, is, is the policy that simple? Honestly? Like, right. and so I just I just refuse to play into that. I, I refuse to to pretend like there's no nuance. I refuse to pretend like there's no complexity to what we're talking about and the difficult problems that we're actually trying to address. I just refuse to do it. It would be very easy. It would make my life much easier. It is so easy to be popular on the right. It's the easiest thing in the world. You know exactly what you have to say. People are willing to hear it. They've been conditioned to hear it. It's the easiest thing in the world. And any and and people and I want voters to just be more skeptical about the people who are telling them exactly what they want to hear every single time. That's interesting. Just be slightly skept- skeptical because you're, you don't be easy to lie to. Don't be easy to lie to. And so, it, look. And in the, you asked, I know you asked me about my background, so I am kind of getting to that. Like, where do I get this ideology from or this this demeanor? Let's say, 
And um, I, I would say probably from the SEAL teams because honest, brutal mm. honesty is is a life or death attribute in the SEAL teams. Right. Um, we do not have any patience or any time for false narrative building, which is basically what politics is all about. And so I do appreciate having veterans in Congress. I didn't always say that, actually, because I was like, well, that Democrat veteran turned out to be a jerk. But, but <laughs> right, right. Now they're not all created the same. <laughs> for the most part now, I and for the most part, this is definitely not applied to all veterans in Congress, but for the most part, um, veterans want to be right. And that, that's a kind of an important attribute. They want to be right. They want to make sure that the conclusion that they've come to has been come to honestly and through some thoughtful debate and consideration and that they're actually right, or at least defensible, at least you're in a defensible position. Mm-hmm. I am I am thoroughly convinced that not a lot of members of Congress actually give a damn about that. Hmm. They, 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 again, there's being right. Because it's easier, cause it's easier to, to not care. It's easier. It's, it's easier to vote no on everything, first of all, right? There's, there's some people who do that. Like, okay. I'm, <laughs> right. I mean, they'd vote against the Bible because there's not enough Jesus in it. You know, I mean, they, it's actually coming out of somebody's mouth. <laughs> so that's pretty know, good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's you know, that's easy. It's easy to come up here and not use any judgment whatsoever. Well, and, let me since, since we're in the middle of it, let me just over the weekend you were at a Texas Liberty Alliance PAC event, um, and basically what you said is there are two types of members of Congress: is performance artists, and then there's legislators. Mm-hmm. performance artists are the ones who get all the attention, the ones that you think are more conservative because they know how to say the slogans really well. Now, I think I think I know what you're saying. Having spent a lot of time under the dome, I think I know what you're saying. But I, I just want to be specific. When you're talking about the performance artists, are we talking about people who, in your mind, know what they're doing is, is either wrong or, or inaccurate and they just carry it out Mm-hmm. For the that, performance, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because obviously, I jump out of airplanes, so <laughs> like, I yeah, do performance, like, so it, it's um, it, that's not quite what I mean. What I mean is political theater. There's a big difference between doing a cool ad and doing political theater. Well, that, yeah, way, and I like, wanted to get to that because I, I there is there is a difference, but I specifically wanted to get what you're talking about, which is not a performance in terms of of uh, theatrical performance. You're talking about their jobs. So, yeah. And so there's a, there's a couple of things that I'd be talking about. One is, is, is sort of the false narrative building, the, the, the knowing, the knowingly perpetuating falsehoods that make your colleagues look bad because you think it makes you look better. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's a form of political theater. Yeah. Another form of political theater, you know, call for a motion to adjourn so that you're fighting the Democrats. Okay. Well, it's, but it's, it just wastes everybody's time. It doesn't actually do anything. Nobody's even watching doing all of these little all of these little tricks up here on the hill, you know, tweeting some kind of insult that is provocative and will get you attention, um, but not further our cause. And so, you know, one one thing I always talk about, and I talked about at that event because I talk about it at every event, is is be and I tell voters be more be more skeptical about who the fighters are, mm-hmm. and ask yourself what is this fighter trying to win? Have they won anything for you? And the answer is most likely not, at least the people who label themselves as fighters. Mm-hmm. You know, and winning in politics looks a lot like persuading people to your side. Ask yourself, if somebody claims to be a fighter, you know, and they're engaging in that political theater constantly, and it's, and it's fun, and it, like, and it gets our side like happy, it makes them think, see, they're up there rep- rep- representing me. But are they? Mm-hmm. I mean, what have they won for you? They've mm-hmm. definitely alienated a lot of people. That's for sure. So how are we supposed to move forward our agenda if we're not persuading anybody? So your, your, your point is the measurement ought to change, right? How we evaluate somebody as a conservative should be based on the outcomes, mm-hmm. not on basically how they make you feel. 100%. I mean, and, and, and the reason I'll do more, I'll do the fun kind of performance things like make an ad that's fun, but it's not provocative, is it? If you look at Texas Reloaded, this ad that goes viral. Who did it provoke? Nobody. Liberals could watch that and still think, oh, that was that was kind of fun. You know, that was kind of fun. There's a reason we do these things because because I do admit that we live in an age of, um, you know, let's call it a reality TV show. And the American public does want some kind of entertainment. But the question is, once you've gotten their attention, what do you do with that power? Do you use it in an honest way and in a 
thoughtful way in a productive way or do you just lie to them for personal gain and mm -hmm. that's the difference between those who engage in complete political theater and those who do not and and this it look this is what i said at that at that event too the quickest way they know that the quickest way to a conservative's heart is not necessarily to bash democrats now it gets some people riled up right but it's kind of used to it the quickest way to a conservative's heart is to convince them that another conservative betrayed them yeah no question you know? Yeah. I mean, that's really what gets an emotional reaction from people. And there are grifters out there who know this, who are always look, you know, it's, it's, yeah, that it's a cottage industry, man. It's been a it cottage is. industry for it decades. It makes money. Yeah. It yeah. makes money. Um, and, uh, and I just, I want our side to be on the lookout for that a little bit more. Yeah. Be skeptical of those people. Let, let me ask you this, because I, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about on the program is, is not taking the bait, trying to, stay as much of a, a team as you possibly could. And I, and I recognize your arguments about how some people make that impossible. But I think what the press has done to try to attribute your comments is they basically have attributed it to the entire Freedom Caucus, right? Where, whereas I know, having seen you work with a lot of those folks, that's not who you're talking about, just is general everywhere. Yeah, no, right? I mean, there's definitely some in there I don't like, obviously, but for the most part, no. I, 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 I brought up that one example about Trump voting record as just as just an, one example among many. If you were oh, part right. of the Freedom Caucus and you were in that room, you wouldn't have been offended. Nobody, that was like a Tea Party group, <laughs> right? Mean, you know, it, it just it wasn't offensive to them at all. I like Jim Jordan a lot. Jim Jordan is is one of these people who. He, he doesn't need to make a name for himself by trying mm -hmm. to utter, undercut his fellow Republican colleagues all the time. Yeah. You, you know, know, it's funny. I was thinking of him when I brought this question up because I know you've worked with him really well in a number of, of Freedom Caucus people. So I wanted, again, to try to be specific. That's not it's not who you're talking about. here. No, no, it's not. Um, again, they got they got brought into that mix because of an example I used about voting records. But I was not talking the, the, the I was what, what I was referring to mostly is, is some of the people who had messaged knowingly, knowingly falsely about H.R. 550, that whole vaccine database thing. Last oh, time. yeah. That, yeah. That was what I was actually talking about. That was the broader point I was making. Um, and so, yeah, there were certainly individuals who did that. There was media outlets that did that. When I said grifters and liars, I wasn't talking about the Freedom Caucus. Right. I was I was talking about a, a, a general group of people that exist on our side. And I didn't mm -hmm. name any names. And I, and I don't find it useful to name names. But given my description, <laughs> I want I want I want people to be now I want their brains to be tuned to listen for those kind of things. Yeah. Well, you know, look, if you take it out of Congress and you find out that, you know, people like Sidney Powell, who raised $14 million off of good example, know, right? I mean, like yeah. Lynn Wood, I'll name some names, Lynn Wood, absolute right. grifter, like with Kyle Rittenhouse. Nobody believed me when I said that before until Kyle Rittenhouse also said it. Yeah, no, no, it's true. It's true. Well, listen, I, I, I'm glad you're speaking out to do what you think is right on this. And I, I agree with you that we ought to have a, a, a free debate within our Republican conference, within the broader conservative movement. We should not all be conditioned to just sort of spit out the same talking points. But at the same time, we also got to move the ball down the field, which is what I think you're trying to do. Uh, tell us about what's going on up there. Tell us about sort of your view of the Biden administration here as we enter. You know, I can't believe it's only been one year. Jesus, this is unbelievable. Uh, but as we enter year two. Well, I, I'd say there's good news and there's bad news. I mean, the, the bad news is all around you um, with high inflation um, an energy industry that that can't get an ounce of funding because nobody wants to invest in an industry that they believe is under attack mm -hmm. um, and may have their taxes raised soon or and may be regulated out of existence. That's a real problem. It's a problem for our gas prices and our electricity prices. Uh, we're, we're, I don't know what the Biden doctrine is on foreign policy. I'm not sure anybody does. And, you know, at least you, you can disagree or agree with Trump's policy. You, you mostly knew what it was. It was sort of this yeah. hyper rationalist um, kind of transactional policy. And, and, and frankly, a good one. I, he, sometimes he's labeled as this like, you know, he didn't start any wars. He was an isolationist. And like are, some people on the right love that. But I'm like, that's not even who he was. <laughs> I can't tell that to Soleimani, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I frankly, I thought his foreign policy it, with, with slight little disagreements here and there was really good. 
Yeah. Uh, if I'm being honest and, um, I don't know what Biden's is. I, I have yet to be able to describe what it is. It's probably similar to Obama's, which I've described as hope and change, right? Cause that was his slogan. So that's his foreign policy too. It's if we, if we hope hard enough, we'll get change. It's, it's also this kind of permanent deep state group think yeah. that, you know what I mean? Like every single one of these guys comes from deep inside the bowels of the state department and they've yeah. sort of formulated their view collectively together over the 30 year period. Yeah. And like, it's just, this ain't, it's the same, right. But it, it has no goals. It has no broader missions. It's just sort of the same. Mm -hmm. They have these truths that they live by. And a good example is John Kerry getting ridiculed because he's, it was about the Palestine Israel issue, you know, saying you'll, you'll never, you'll never get, I think, I think that the statement was something like, you'll never get the Arabs to the table without Palestine at the table. And it just turned out not to be true. It turned out that real politic played a much bigger role. Leverage, incentives. Th those are the words. Those are the truths you have to live by. Human yeah. nature, incentive structures, and, and leverage. Th these are things that work in the Middle East and in foreign policy. Um, if, if Trump had a doctrine, it was, it, was, it was kind of understanding that, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, the point is, back to Biden, he doesn't know what the hell he's. <laughs> that so, much is evident. So that's bad. Um, that that's bad. No, the good news is is we have this system that doesn't let you get anything done. Yeah. Uh, you know, the good news is all the well. Again, this is bad news and good news because bad news is they can do a lot of damage just by being in charge. The good news is they haven't passed any of their agenda really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could look at the you know they passed the infrastructure bill. Um, it, it's. That's bad because it spends too much money, in my opinion. But but people wrongfully think that's the Build Back Better plan. People wrongfully think that the stuff in there was all Green New Deal nonsense yeah. and human infrastructure. It's actually not true. Uh, the, the content of that bill is not nearly as bad as people think. I personally just think it was three times more expensive than it needed to be, not right. paid for. We easily could have done some good on infrastructure just by spending old COVID money and, and leaving it at that. So that's it's it's important to get the get our facts straight when we're mad about something. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Just in general, as a general rule in life. Um, but they're having a real hard time getting this reconciliation bill through. Uh, that's the good news. Um, and you know, the I can have some bad news that we'll get something through eventually. Yeah, it'll be damaging. It'll be inflationary. It'll be hard to 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 claw back those government programs once in. Um, if, if we take majorities, we'll have to use one of our reconciliation golden tokens to claw some of that stuff back and do what we want. So it's just, it sucks. Um, but, you know, be thankful for a republic that has some pretty harsh checks and balances yeah. on it. That, yeah. when a, that when a party that's in the majority in the House, the Senate, and the presidency like, still can't really get a, get a, a very radical agenda through easily. Yeah. That's I mean, this is why this is these are moments why you resist the temptation to eliminate those checks and balances when you've got your hands on power because it's fleeting. And, uh, you know, at some point it, it can come back to bite you, as as Democrats found out with the Supreme Court. Right. So, uh, hey, listen, I want to ask you about um, most Americans, I think, were introduced to you for the first time through Pete Davidson and Saturday Night Live. Right. You're just elected. This guy takes a shot at you. There's a big hub hub. You go back, you go on to Saturday Night Live. I mean, you, you go from relative anonymity outside of your district to like a household name overnight at the beginning of your congressional career. I mean, what's that like? I don't know. Um, I still don't know. But that's, <laughs> I, it's, it's, I, I guess it's surreal. Um, it was so, I mean, the day that that happened, uh, it, it, we, I had this sort of sense of annoyance. I wasn't used to dealing with um, things popping up in the media yeah. and it felt, it uh, felt like an annoying thing we had to deal with because it, it was just, it was, it was like the day before the election, maybe two days before the election. And, you know, I had a bunch of events scheduled and that, that that's what I was worried about. And I, I was annoyed that I had to spend 10 minutes outside in the parking lot before going into this event and, and think about what I was going to tweet. Right. It just yeah. it just wasn't used to that. It was it was strange. I, so my point being, it was kind of lost on me how how okay. this would this would blow up. And I don't you know, and then it, and then it blew up a little more and a little more. Um, Next thing you know, you're on set. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And um, <laughs> but but like like if you, you know, if you know me well, I mean, th this is my surprised face. 
It's always, <laughs> yeah, I don't I'm picking that up. <laughs> yeah. I just don't, um, I, I don't react emotionally to things. I don't like, I'm never law. I'm never like awe inspired by something. I wish I, was, <laughs> I, wish I had more of those things, but it, I think it's, I think, I think they beat the emotions out of you in the seal. <laughs> <laughs> like, with, with, well, with let me just say this. <laughs> the one thing water. that's, the one thing that's awe inspiring, and I know you're a very happily married man, so you wouldn't talk to uh, Pete Davidson about this, but it's awe inspiring the fact that that guy has brainwashed as many beautiful women into loving him. This, as this drives me and my wife crazy. Um, <laughs> we're big fans of Kate Beckinsale. Right. And I right. Just don't Serendipity. Get it. I mean, what the heck's gotten into her? I don't, don't get it. I just, <laughs> Kim Kardashian now, it's weird. I, you know, he, he is this, um, and it felt like this at Saturday Night Live too. Um, let's, he, he's like a project for people, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like Lauren Michaels, it. like he just, they, he's just likable to this group of people and like, they want to take care of him Yeah, because I'm like, he's not that funny either. His stand up is very mediocre. Right. And, and, and I'll say that now because he, he took a lot of swipes at me, um, in his Netflix special, like a year later. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a real. He jerk. didn't even let up. Yeah, it's incredible. yeah. It, but it was, and it wasn't even funny, right? Again, like I think you should be. I think comedy should be extreme, but it's got to be funny. That's the only rule. Yeah. And like guys, guys like him, if they're not they're not talented enough to do that, then they, you know, then they just kind of fall on their face. They just end up doing insults and thinking right. and laughter, but but they but they lack the skill set to actually make that into a good joke. I saw I saw Pete Davidson making fun of Joe Rogan the other day about the ivermectin thing on Saturday Night Live, and it was it was just another skit that just totally fell flat. I'm like, you're. And I thought to myself, you're just jealous because Joe Rogan's actually talented. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. But I, I, for whatever he's done, he must have sold his soul to, to, to obtain some kind of mind control over beautiful women. Because as far as I could tell, that's the only thing that guy's got going. He, he's got that like, oh, shucks, I'm a nice boy. I don't know, man. I don't Wish know. That, I don't know how that works. But <laughs> anyway, listen, uh, Congressman, I got three big questions that we ask, to ask everybody on the show. And it starts with, if you could plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's just got a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Hey, so I mean, it's kind of cheating because it's like, well, I get to eat a lot now <laughs> for my last meal. <laughs> yeah. But if you, if you, and if you make me, if you make me get more specific, I, I would probably go like um, bone in ribeye. Oh, there you go. Um, but I, and on uh, your last meal, you can have the turkey and the bone in ribeye because I was like, okay. you know, you're sliding inside. Yeah, Thanksgiving's kind of, you can just, you know, it's Thanksgiving. You can put a lot of different, items in there that's right that's right okay i mean a lot of food i think is the bottom line of yeah. your, your answer okay all right so if you never got into politics like if you just never were interested in any of this at all what do you think you'd be doing with your life have you seen kill bill yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, i mean no, i mean the tr truthfully i never wanted to leave the seal teams um i i left the navy kicking and screaming um mm -hmm. And my wife and I loved our life there. We would have stayed at least 20 years. And uh, that's just, that's just always, that was always my, my goal in life. I, I did not want to leave. And I didn't get into politics kind of like, I, I was looking at policy jobs yeah. um, sort of behind the scenes for, for a while after the, after the SEAL teams um, sort of searching for that next role. And, um, and then all of a sudden a seat opened up and somebody suggested I should run and that was kind of the first time I thought about running. Next thing you know, you're a politician. Yeah, next thing you know. <laughs> well, you, you do a good job hiding the politician side of, of the member of Congress thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so this is the last one. I'm very interested in your answer on this. And it's about what goes to your core motivations. And we put it up in two polls. Basically, you're motivated by the thrill of victory, which is the sunny optimist charging up the hill kind of point of view. Or the agony of defeat, which is the Michael Jordan, you know, sort of just like kills you to think that you could ever lose. And the feeling that you, you get when you lose motivates you entirely. So the question is, what motivates you more, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat? And you, I knew you were going to ask that. And I've been struggling with how to answer this because I'm not sure it's one or the other. Um, part of me thinks you should embrace failure. Um, 
embrace pain and suffering because it always makes you stronger. It sucks. That's part of, that's part of an agony defeat though. You know, I mean, that's like, that's, if you're motivated by it, you have to have that or else you're not motivated. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a more realistic, I guess, place to be in, but I'm certainly motivated by the thrill of victory. I mean, who wouldn't be? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I wasn't, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm giving you a, a, a deep answer there or if I'm being wishy-washy. No, I think, I mean, look, I think I, I think I get it. I think you've got, I mean, everybody's thrill of victory. The, the question is how long you hang on to it. Right. I mean, for the deepest of like Michael Jordan figures, the thrill of victory lasts, lasts about an afternoon. <laughs> you know, whereas a defeat mm-hmm. lasts forever. You drag that around for the rest of your life and you use it as motivation and everywhere else. I think that's probably the best way to think of it. Okay. When you phrase it that way, when you phrase it that way, I think that's, that does describe me a little bit more. I think probably, I, th- I think, I think defeats probably linger longer mm-hmm. and victories are fleeting. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, pe- people like us, we, that's why we need to keep achieving, mm-hmm. keep going, because you don't rest on your laurels. That's actually what they call a soft truth, SOF truth, the Special Operations Forces truth. You never rest on your laurels. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of and it kind of gets to this other saying that you hear a lot in the SEAL teams, which is the only easy day was yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that means that quite literally, too, in buds, you know, yeah. that it only gets harder. <laughs> But it's also it's also a way of it's also a way of saying that you 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 cannot rest on what you've accomplished. Right. That's that makes you lesser of a man. Should you do that? That's you know, fascinating. It, it effectively means that you've quit. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe maybe that answers your question. It does. It answers it perfectly. Listen, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Thank you for putting all of this into perspective and stay in touch. I'd love to talk to you again soon. I appreciate that. Thanks, right. Josh. Take Thanks care. Thanks for having me.